USS North Carolina, or BB-55, is, well, considered the lead ship of the North Carolina-class battleships, but her sister Washington was actually launched first, almost two weeks before her. Granted, North Carolina was laid down and commissioned first, so in terms of which one is older, I'll argue about that in the comments, though most seem to feel like the launch date should be the birth date, therefore making North Carolina the little sister. But in any event, the North Carolina class was actually the first new battleship design built under the Washington Naval Treaty System, and as such, they were bound by the terms of the Second London Naval Treaty of 1936, which added a restriction of her main battery of guns. They could be no larger than 14 inches. North Carolina is not a dreadnought, she is a fast battleship, designed for higher speeds, though still with heavy firepower. Originally meant to have 12 14-inch guns, this was later changed, as after the ships were authorized, the U.S. invoked the Escalator Clause in the treaty that permitted an increase to 16-inch guns in the event that any member nation refused to sign the treaty, and Japan refused to sign the treaty. So okay, you guys want to play? We'll play. She was 728 feet 9 inches long overall, with a beam of 108 feet 4 inches and a draft of 32 feet 11 and a half inches. Her standard displacement was 35,562 tons, and at full load, she would hit 45,519 tons. Her power came from four General Electric steam turbines, each driving a single propeller shaft, using steam provided by eight oil-fired Babcock and Wilcox boilers. She was rated for 121,000 shaft horsepower, and the turbines were intended to give a top speed of 28 knots, 32 miles per hour. She had a cruising range of 17,450 nautical miles at a speed of 15 knots. She also had three Vought OS-2U Kingfisher float planes for aerial reconnaissance, launched from aircraft catapults on her fantail. Her peacetime crew numbered 1,800 officers and enlisted men, but during World War II, that would increase to 99 officers and 2,035 enlisted men. Her armament consisted of nine 16-inch Mark VI guns and a trio of three gun turrets on her center line, two in a super-firing pair forward. Her secondary battery was 25-inch dual-purpose guns, mounted in twin turrets clustered amidships. As designed, she was equipped with an anti-aircraft battery of 16 1.1-inch guns and 18 50 cal M2 Browning machine guns, but that would be later expanded during the course of the war. Her main armor belt was 12 inches thick, while the main armor deck is up to 5.5 inches thick. The main battery gun turrets have 16 inch thick faces, mounted atop barbettes that were protected with the same thickness of steel, actually. Her conning tower had 14.7 inch thick sides, and her armor layout was designed to deal with opponents that were using 14 inch guns. And while it was known that Japan in particular was building ships with larger guns, the design couldn't be altered to actually increase the armor. So that was a bit of a weakness, but it never really came into play at any point. North Carolina's keel was laid down at the New York Naval Shipyard on October 27, 1937. She was launched June 13, 1940, and commissioned on April 9, 1941. The ceremony was attended by the governor of North Carolina, J. Melville Broughton. Her first commanding officer was Captain Olaf M. Hustved, and her shakedown crews took her into the Caribbean, and she spent the rest of the year working up till the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941. With the United States now directly at war, North Carolina was desperately needed, but she was ready to go. As soon as Pearl Harbor happened, she began extensive battle training to prepare for combat in the Pacific. But her first operation wasn't in the Pacific at all. It was in April of 1942 when she was deployed to Naval Station Argentia. She was part of a force intended to block a potential sortie by the German battleship Tirpitz. But Tirpitz was content to stay in her fjord and not really do much of anything. So North Carolina's place was taken by her cousin, South Dakota, so she could head over to the Pacific in the middle of 1942. She passed through the Panama Canal in June 
alongside the aircraft carriers Wasp and Long Island, as well as nine destroyers. On June 15th, she was assigned to Task Force 18, centered around Wasp, under the command of Rear Admiral Lay Noyes. North Carolina was sent to join the Guadalcanal Campaign as part of Task Force 16, which included aircraft carrier Enterprise. The unit was actually a part of Task Force 61, under the command of Vice Admiral Frank Fletcher, and they were supposed to cover the landing of the 1st Marine Division on Guadalcanal, who were to seize the airfield being constructed there by the Japanese. North Carolina covered Enterprise on the first day of the invasion on August 7th, and stayed with her to keep her safe from Japanese air attacks. There was a serious concern of land-based torpedo bombers, however, so Vice Admiral Fletcher withdrew the carrier groups the following day. The initial landing did meet with little resistance, but a Japanese cruiser squadron attacked the fleet on the night of August 9th, which resulted in a major defeat on Allied naval forces in the Battle of Sabo Island. The Navy did consider forming a surface combat force to counter the cruisers, and it would have been centered on North Carolina, but it was decided instead that the need to protect the carrier task forces was way too great to strip away their heavy units, so North Carolina remained on active support duty with the carriers. She would participate in the Battle of the Eastern Solomons on the 24th and 25th of August. At the time, American forces had detected a group of Japanese carriers and launched attacks from Saratoga that sank the light carrier Ryujo. But the Japanese would swiftly counterattack, and North Carolina was actually the first to detect it, shortly after 1600 hours. The Japanese initially concentrated on firing at Enterprise, so North Carolina contributed her anti-aircraft fire to protect her charge. Enterprise would increase speed to 30 knots, which caused North Carolina to drop back to 4,000 yards astern. While she was in this position, a group of seven Aichi D-3A dive bombers attacked North Carolina at 1643, but every single one of them actually missed. North Carolina didn't take any major damage during the battle, though a single member of her crew was killed by a strafing aircraft. Enterprise herself was hit by three bombs, but she was able to stay afloat. Enterprise had to withdraw for repairs, so in the meantime, North Carolina was transferred to Task Force 17 to cover Saratoga instead. They operated off of Guadalcanal for the next several weeks, during which time, Japanese submarines fired torpedoes at North Carolina twice. The first passed about 300 yards off her port side. The second, however, which happened on September 15th from the submarine I-19, actually hit her. I-19 fired a spread of six torpedoes at WASP in Task Force 18. Two or three of those hit. Two of the other torpedoes continued on to the ships of Task Force 17, which was five nautical miles away. One hit a destroyer, O'Brien, and the fourth hit North Carolina. The torpedo hit North Carolina 20 feet below the waterline on her port side and tore a 32 by 18 foot hole in her plating. Five men were killed, but besides the shock from the blast disabling her forward turret, the torpedo didn't really damage North Carolina that badly. Flooding did occur, causing her to develop a 5.5 degrees list to port, but that was simply corrected with counter-flooding, and she remained on station with Saratoga. I-19's lucky hits would not take North Carolina, though it did take the other two. Wasp had to be scuttled that evening, due to the damage to her, and O'Brien foundered a month later. Which I know sounds weird, but it was because she hadn't been repaired from the damage and her hull eventually buckled under the strain. But once North Carolina withdrew, she was detached to Pearl Harbor to get the repairs she did need, and that lasted from September 30th to November 17th. She returned to the South Pacific and began screening again for Saratoga and Enterprise. And the fleet had been strengthened by the arrival of North Carolina's sister Washington, who served as flagship for Rear Admiral Willis Lee. The siblings were grouped together as Task Force 64 under Lee's command, and they covered convoys carrying soldiers and supplies to the Solomon Islands for the rest of 1942 and into 43. In March, North Carolina would go back to Pearl Harbor for a refit that included new radars 
and improve fire control equipment. When she returned to the South Pacific, she joined up with Task Force 36 that was now under the command of Rear Admiral Glenn B. Davis, and consisted of her cousins Indiana and Massachusetts. Together, they covered amphibious assault forces during Operation Cartwheel, which was the campaign to isolate the Japanese stronghold at Rabaul, which happened in late June and early July. They didn't see any action during the campaign, however, and in September, she made another trip to Pearl Harbor to make preparations for the attack on the Gilbert Islands. With the Gilbert and Marshall Islands campaign, the fleet was organized into Task Force 50, which was divided into several task groups, North Carolina sortied on November 10th, once again alongside Enterprise, as part of Task Group 50.2, and they were to begin with assaults on Macon, Tarawa, and Abamama. North Carolina covered the carriers while they raided the islands, beginning on November 19th. On December 8th, she was detached to form Task Group 50.8, alongside Massachusetts, Indiana, South Dakota, and her sister Washington, under Lee's command they would commence bombarding the island of Nauru, while the fleet prepared for the next operation in the campaign over in the Marshalls. She then escorted the carrier Bunker Hill during a series of strikes on Kaviang on the island of New Ireland in late December. On the 6th of January in 1944, Task Force 58, which was a fast carrier task force, was created under the command of Rear Admiral Mark Mitscher and North Carolina continued her role as an escort for the fleet's carriers, with the unit as part of Task Group 58.2. During the Battle of Kwajalein, she initially remained with the carriers during the pre-invasion bombardment, but then she was detached to close with the island and join the bombardment group targeting Roy Namor. During the attack, she actually sank a cargo ship in the harbor. As the islands were finally secured over four days, Task Force 58 departed to raid Truk, which had been Japan's primary staging area in the Central Pacific. By that point, she had been transferred to Task Group 58.3. Known as Operation Hailstone, the attack inflicted serious damage, sinking or destroying 39 ships, wrecking 211 aircraft, and damaging another 104 planes. With the Marshals and Gilbert secured, the Fast Carrier Task Force embarked on a series of raids in the Central Pacific to prepare for the upcoming attack on the Marianas. They sortied from Majuro in late March to begin the first attack on Peleu and Woliai. During those operations, North Carolina managed to shoot down a single Japanese aircraft. Just, just, the, just the one. But she got it, though. Got it! The fleet then sailed south to support the U.S. Army's landing at Hollandia during the New Guinea campaign from the 13th to the 24th of April. Another attack on truck would follow on the 29th and the 30th. North Carolina shot down another Japanese aircraft during that attack. Yes! Another one! Mark that down! I got two! And two over Kingfisher float planes were sent to rescue a downed pilot who had crashed off the reef. One of the planes capsized on landing and the second was unable to take off, so th this was this was really a mess, what I'm trying to say. So a submarine named Tang picked up the men instead. On May 1st, North Carolina and six other battleships organized as Task Group 58.7 and bombarded Pon Pai, destroying Japanese artillery batteries, anti-aircraft guns, as well as damaging the airfield on the island. Task Force 58 then returned to its bases in Majuro and Atawetak on May 4th, and from there, North Carolina departed to Pearl Harbor for repairs. She would later rejoin the fleet at Majuro when it was preparing for the attack on the Marianas. She returned to Task Group 58.7, which was distributed between the four carrier task groups. She and the rest of 58 sortied on June 6th to launch the first assault, targeting the island of Saipan. On top of protecting the carriers, she also bombarded the island to cover the minesweepers as they cleared paths to the invasion beach. She shelled Tanapag Harbor, sank several small vessels, and destroyed several supply dumps. On June 15th, the Marines went ashore, and a Japanese counterattack struck the fleet, though all but two of the aircraft were shot down by the carrier's combat air patrol. Of those two, North Carolina herself got one. The landing itself was a breach of Japan's inner defensive perimeter, and that triggered them to launch a major counterthrust with the first mobile fleet as they approached 
North Carolina and the rest of Task Force 58 steamed to meet it on June 18th, which led to the Battle of the Philippine Sea on the 19th and 20th of June. North Carolina, the other battleships, with four cruisers and 13 destroyers, were deployed around 15 nautical miles west of the carrier groups to screen the likely path of approach. The Japanese launched their aircraft first and probed the American fleet's defenses. North Carolina and her sister Washington were the first to open fire. And during the action, which was fought primarily by the carriers, the U.S. fleet inflicted serious losses on the Japanese. They destroyed hundreds of their aircraft and sank three of their carriers. North Carolina herself shot down two Japanese planes, and she would remain stationed off the Marianas for the next two weeks before being detached for an overhaul at Puget Sound. Work on her lasted through October, and that kept her from participating in much of the Philippines' campaign. She would rejoin the fleet at their new forward base at Ulithi on November 7th. She joined up with Task Group 38.3, which was the fast carrier task force having passed from 5th Fleet to 3rd Fleet Command. The carriers would then embark on a series of strikes on Japanese positions on Leyte, Luzon, and the Visayas to support army operations on shore. During that time, North Carolina would shoot down a kamikaze aircraft. Such attacks would continue into mid-December, and intensified during the invasion of Mindoro on December 15th. North Carolina was also with the fleet when it was caught by Typhoon Cobra, but she was not seriously damaged, able to weather the severe storm. Once they returned to Ulithi, the Fast Carrier Task Force operated a series of strikes on targets on Formosa, the coast of French Indochina, occupied China, and the Ryukyu Islands in January of 1945. She remained in Task Group 38.3 for that operation, and her carrier group struck northern Formosa on the 3rd and 4th of January, though poor weather hampered flight operations. Further attacks would strike targets on Luzon to destroy reserves of kamikaze aircraft there. On January 10th, the carrier groups entered the South China Sea, to strike targets in French Indochina on the assumption that significant Japanese naval forces were present, but this turned out to be untrue. There were only merchant ships and some minor warships, which were still sunk, but yeah, not, not what we expected. During those raids, other elements of the Allied fleet invaded Lingayen Gulf on Luzon. In February, North Carolina escorted carriers during the attacks on the Japanese island of Honshu to disrupt enemy forces that might interfere with the planned invasion of Iwo Jima. By this point, the 5th Fleet had reassumed command of the Fast Carrier Task Force, and North Carolina was now part of Task Group 58.4. They sortied from Ulithi on February 10th, and conducted a series of training exercises off Tinian on the 12th, refueling at sea on the 14th, and continued north to launch strikes on the Tokyo area two days later. The raids continued through February 17th, and the following day they withdrew to refuel, and then were sent to hit other islands in the Bonin chain to isolate Iwo Jima. During the preparatory bombardment for that attack, North Carolina, her sister Washington, as well as the heavy cruiser Indianapolis, were detached from the task group to reinforce Task Force 54, which was the assault force for the invasion. She remained on station during their assault and provided fire support as they fought their way across the island. The following day, the carrier groups reassembled and refueled for further operations against the Japanese mainland. When she left Iwo Jima, the fleet resumed air attacks on the home islands to prepare for the next amphibious assault on Okinawa. The first of these, in late February, hit targets in the Tokyo area, followed by another attack on Iwo Jima the next day. They then refueled, and on March 1st, raided Okinawa then returned to Ulithi on March 4th. While in Ulithi, the fleet was reorganized, and North Carolina was transferred to Task Group 58.3. They then sortied on March 14th for additional attacks on Japan, and later hit targets on Kyushu, causing significant damage to Japanese facilities on the island, as well as sinking or damaging numerous warships. The task groups withdrew to refuel and reorganize on March 22nd, however. Several of the carriers had been damaged by kamikaze air attacks, and North Carolina was assigned to the group of ships tasked with escorting them back to Ulithi for repairs. 
The carrier raids on the home islands and the Ryukyus continued after the landing on Okinawa on April 1st. North Carolina returned to the fleet, and she was assigned to Task Group 58.2. Five days later, she shot down three kamikazes. In the somewhat chaotic anti-aircraft barrage, another ship accidentally hit North Carolina with a 5-inch shell. This killed three and wounded 44. On April 7th, the Japanese launched a major air-naval counterattack on the landing centered on the battleship Yamato. But she was taken down by carrier aircraft. North Carolina only shot down a single Japanese bomber. But another major kamikaze attack struck the fleet on April 11th. She would shoot down two more on April 17th. And two days later, she was sent to support infantry attacks on Okinawa, before heading back for another overhaul at Pearl Harbor. She would rejoin the fleet at Leyte Gulf in late June, before embarking on another series of attacks on Japan on July 1st. By that point, the Fast Carrier Task Force had been transferred to the Third Fleet again, so she was with Task Group 38.3. The air attacks would begin on July 10th, with over a thousand aircraft hitting airfields around Tokyo. The strikes would last for more than a week, until another typhoon approached and forced them to withdraw to avoid it on July 19th. During this time, one of North Carolina's Kingfishers picked up a downed pilot in Tokyo Bay under heavy fire. And following the Japanese surrender on August 15th, North Carolina would contribute men with the initial occupation force and entered Sagami Bay on August 27th with the rest of the fleet. She thereafter patrolled the coast until September 5th when she headed into Tokyo Bay to re-embark the men. The following day, she was assigned to Task Force 11, along with the New Mexico-class battleships, which was to return to the United States. She would then sail south to Okinawa to take on men bound for home as part of Operation Magic Carpet. During her wartime service, only 10 of her crew would die, 67 would be wounded, and she would receive 15 battle stars, the most of any battleship in the U.S. fleet during World War II. She transited the Panama Canal on October 8th and arrived in Boston on October 17th. She then underwent an overhaul in the Brooklyn Navy Yard and conducted training operations off the East Coast. She was actually the only American treaty battleship to see any significant service after the end of the war. The vast majority would be immediately removed from service, but not North Carolina. She stayed around for at least a couple years, though she was eventually decommissioned on June 27, 1947, in New York and placed in reserve. While she was sitting out of service, the Navy did look into several plans to possibly modernize or convert her to other uses. A series of studies in 1954 focused on the concept of improving her speed to 31 knots, which would require a significant reduction in displacement and a much more powerful propulsion system. The displacement issue could actually be solved with the removal of her rear turret, but there just wasn't enough room in her hull to place a power plant that could push her to the desired speed. The Navy also looked into possibly converting her into a helicopter carrier, which would have involved removing all her main and secondary guns, except for her forward turret, which would be retained just to keep her balanced properly. These would be exchanged for a flight deck and facilities for 28 helicopters and a battery of 16 3-inch guns. But then the Navy figured that a new purpose-built helicopter carrier would actually be cheaper in the long run and wind up with a better result, so they abandoned the project. She did remain in the Navy's inventory until she was stricken from the Naval Vessel Register on June 1st, 1960, and she was slated to be broken up for scrap, just as her sister was. In her case, there was an intervention. A resident of North Carolina, James Craig, founded a campaign to save her. He actually modeled it on the Battleship Texas Commission that had saved USS Texas, the last dreadnought. Craig would manage to convince then-governor of North Carolina, Luther H. Hodges, to ask the Navy to delay scrapping of North Carolina. Craig then went on to raise $250,000 to prepare a site to host the vessel and to tow her there. 
as well as fund work to prepare her for visitors, as she was supposed to be a museum ship. He managed to obtain the help of WRAL, a TV station, which broadcast a Save Our Ship advertisement campaign. He also ran ads in numerous state newspapers to spread the word across North Carolina about the movement to save their battleship. Craig was able to secure more than $330,000 for the project, and eventually he settled on a site in Wilmington, which was further inland and therefore more protected from hurricanes. The governor had been successful in delaying the Navy, and on September 6, 1961, North Carolina was given to, well, North Carolina. She was given to her state. She was towed out of New Jersey bound for Wilmington by a group of nine tugboats on September 25th of that year. Though moving her was not without incident. On October 2nd, the tugs lost control of North Carolina. You don't have enough tugs to control me. And she wound up colliding with a floating seafood restaurant, but somehow only caused minor damage. When her berth was completed, located across the Cape Fear River from downtown Wilmington, about 28 miles from the river's confluence with the Atlantic Ocean, she was formally opened on April 29th, 1962 as a memorial to more than 11,000 North Carolinians who died while serving during World War II. It was a beautiful success in terms of historic preservation, and North Carolina's life since being turned into a museum ship has it been completely uneventful. In 1964, a Kingfisher float plane that had crashed in British Columbia, Canada during the war was donated to the museum since, well, she used to carry those for one, and for two it had been salvaged. In the early 80s, when the Navy reactivated the Iowa class, parts were cannibalized from North Carolina to help restore the Iowa's to service. Engine room components that were no longer available in the Navy's inventory accounted for most of the material taken she was, however, declared a National Historic Landmark on November 10th, 1982, with the application noting that she was in excellent condition and remained in her wartime configuration. Work to maintain her is an ongoing effort, as I have mentioned many, many, many times. When it comes to preserving a ship, it is a never-ending fight. Ships, especially, because they're in water, rust very quickly and need intensive maintenance just all the time to keep them afloat. And the larger the ship is, the more expensive that is. So give some props to any floating museum you find. They, they have to work overtime to make this happen. In relation to that, in 1998, her operators ran Operation Ship Shape, which is a donation drive to secure funds to make repairs to North Carolina, including her teak deck. Funds were also allocated to repair her hull, which, by the early 2000s, had deteriorated significantly, because, of course, it did. That, that, that always, literally always happens. In some places, corrosion had reduced the thickness of the hull to as thin as only 0.15 inches. Which is horrifying, actually. They considered moving her to a dry dock for the work, but that would have been way too expensive for them at the time. So, the caretakers decided to use the same method that had been utilized to refurbish Alabama. They erected a coffer dam around North Carolina's hull and pumped it dry. Basically, it was a makeshift dry dock. They wound up replacing her damaged hull plates and repainted it to better protect it from the elements. In 2018, a walkway was erected around North Carolina to allow visitors to view her from all sides. Repairs to her hull were completed in 2021. At the beginning of just this year, 2024, the memorial and museum is one of North Carolina's most visited tourist sites. In 2022, the museum had nearly 250,000 visitors, and that was the most financially successful year in their history. It would certainly seem that North Carolina is in very good hands, and the showboat of the U.S. Navy will remain with us for many years to come. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders, some do 267, Orange Glass, Benjamin Owens, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, Brian, Jack Carson's Railroad Videos, Lord Off 444, A Person 723, Royal Hunter 2860, Isurfer 1405, Charles Kwiatkowski, Matt Weaver, Tom Red Lion, NS Productions 8104, Wheel Jack 8401, Rescues Greyhounds, The Baxter, Caleb Crossway, Ohio Trucker 1, Andrew Bowen, Josh Johnson, Caleb Rainwaters, Prez Drenton, Master of None, Mr. Sleepy, Travis Delinsky, Jared Brussel, Joshua Long, 
Amtrak 2024 Productions, Tommy Rossini, Ben McCullough, Panzer Kitson 131-232, Mark Holding, Dr. Race 78, G Wiz, Mr. Terevel, Liam Wright, Hayden DeGrow, Metal for Life Guy, Battle 604, Hannah Bird, Railroad Preserver 2000, and of course, my dad. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fun farewell.